We have before us tonight a unique human being, absolutely unique, and I'm totally privileged, as I said at the start, to be even honoured to be able to say a few words in his presence. I'm so totally honoured about that fact. A person of integrity, of soundness of judgment, who has been able to put before his own country and the world criticism about their deceitful ways of behaving and dealing with other nation states or with other peoples. And what a marvellous thing. As human beings, we have a fellow human being amongst us capable of that courage, that integrity and that passion to ensure that there is a voice for the voiceless, a voice for the downtrodden, a voice for those who are the subject of the powerful and privileged because they have power and they can therefore rule upon us. And I'm, I am so privileged and so pleased that the Sydney Committee for the Peace Prize have selected one of the most worthy recipients of this particular award. And can I just say, I feel humbled to have been considered in any way to be the recipient in the previous years and to be in the presence of Professor Chomsky, who has done far more for the globe, for the quality of humanity, and for human beings to find themselves in a way that is far more based on truth and on justice and on integrity and about equality at its highest levels and not to give credence to the hollowness of those words when they are espoused by powerful and particularly influential nation states in their relationships to others. So can I please express my thanks to the City of Sydney Peace Prize Committee, to Professor Chomsky for accepting this. It enhances us as Australians and let's move forward from this in a way that we can rectify our own backyard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it's uh, unnecessary to say how to say much about how uh, uh, grateful I am for the honor and uh, the wonderful atmosphere, and how gratifying it is to join a group of people who I uh, greatly admire and respect. Uh, some of whom former recipients uh, are close personal friends for many years. Uh, on an occasion like this, uh, 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 this is a phrase that uh, resonates in my mind, often does in fact. Uh, it's uh, a declaration that was uh, issued by uh, Bertrand Russell and uh, uh, Albert Einstein in 1955. It was a call to the people of the world, a plea actually, to face a question that's, uh, as they put it, uh, stark and uh, desperate and uh, inescapable. Uh, either uh, mankind will put an end to war or we will put an end to the human race. And that's, uh, uh, they were thinking of course of nuclear war primarily and uh, since that time uh, we have come very close to a virtually terminal nuclear war a number of times. Uh, the danger continues. Uh, in fact, it, right today it's very much alive. Uh, the uh, area of uh, 
primary concern uh, now is uh, West and South Asia, that region. Um, and in fact, if you've been, happen to have been reading the papers carefully for the last few days, uh, you'll notice that there have been uh, exercises in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, either actually intended or psychological warfare, uh, aimed at uh, bombing of Iran, Israeli actions. There's been uh, uh, a, a rash of newspaper articles and newspaper reports in the Israeli press about an apparent uh, decision of the government to proceed with uh, bombing Iran's uh, 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 nuclear, nuclear sites. Uh, 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 very strikingly, there's been a long series uh, for some months now of uh, uh, declaration statements by uh, uh, former high security officials in Israel, uh, heads of Mossad and so on, uh, people who rarely say anything, uh, speaking very strongly, uh, uh, denouncing the plan, saying there'll be disastrous and horrible effects. Uh, they wouldn't be coming out publicly unless they had some information that uh, these are, plans are actually in the works. It's worth remembering that uh, Israel did strike a, a nuclear reactor once before, uh, Osirak reactor in Iraq, and uh, though it's not too well known, uh, there was uh, 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 credible information right away, and it has since been confirmed even by U.S. intelligence, that that bombing attack actually initiated Saddam Hussein's uh, nuclear weapons program. Uh, the reactor, it appears, was only uh, capable of uh, um, producing uh, low-grade uranium for uh, energy purposes. But after the attack, a secret uh, nuclear, power, nuclear weapons program was initiated, and we know where that led to. And it's conceivable that that could happen again, uh, along with uh, other uh, uh, very uh, uh, threatening and dangerous consequences that could follow from an attack of that sort. Uh, we'll know very soon whether it's uh, whether it's happened, but it's uh, too close for comfort. Uh, there are things that can be done about these problems. I should say that uh, uh, for, for several years now, uh, U.S. Um, analysts have been uh, arguing that the most uh, dangerous problem in the world, a security problem, is Iran's possible development of uh, nuclear weapons. And it's, it's interesting to see why they think it's such a danger. Uh, the question is rarely asked, but there is an authoritative answer to it. The authoritative answer comes from uh, the highest sources, namely the, uh, the Pentagon and U.S. intelligence. They give annual reports to Congress on the global security situation, and uh, they've, of course, discussed this repeatedly. And they do agree that uh, the Iranian potential for nuclear weapons, whether they're doing it or not, they don't know, is extreme, an extreme danger. And the reason they say is because it's, go it's going to be part of Iran's deterrent strategy. Uh, they have a detailed analysis of the Iranian military. Uh, they argue that it's uh, very small, it's uh, even expenses are very low, even by the standards of the region, and it's aimed specifically for defense. Its, its goal is to deter an invasion long enough for uh, diplomacy to set in. And they add that if Iran is developing nuclear weapons, that would be part of their deterrent strategy. So why is a deterrent strategy such a threat? Well, very simple. A deterrent strategy can deter. Uh, it can prevent uh, the United States and its allies from free, uh, unconstrained military action uh, in the region because there'll be a deterrent. And that's a threat if you, of course, intend to carry out uh, military action, military uh, attacks at will. And that's the threat. And we should recognize that our own countries are uh, interpret the, the possibility of a deterrent as a very serious threat. But 
tells us a lot about ourselves and about the potential for uh, the very, very dangerous consequences, many of which, uh, some of which are in process right now, others can come. Uh, is there a way to deal with these problems? Well, there's, there's a kind of a narrow way, which has enormous uh, international support, and that is to uh, move towards uh, developing a nuclear weapons-free zone in the Middle East. Now, there are several such initiatives around the world, uh, uh, Africa, Pacific Islands, uh, other places. Uh, they have not really been implemented, and it's important to know why. Uh, so take the African uh, nuclear weapons free zone. Uh, there's one impediment to its being implemented, and that's because Britain and the United States insist that an African island, Diego Garcia, which was a former British dependency, be available for uh, uh, nuclear weapon storage, uh, 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 nuclear submarines, and so on. Uh, they use it as one of the main bases for the bombing in Central Asia. Uh, Obama has recently built it up to uh, extend it. It's, uh, it, can, uh, it has facilities for nuclear submarines. That means submarines with nuclear-tipped missiles. Well, as long as that is going on, uh, the African uh, uh, nuclear-free zone can't really be implemented. And the same is true in the Pacific area. Uh, the Pacific nuclear free zone was held up at first by France, uh, which wanted to use its Pacific dependencies for uh, nuclear weapons testing. I think that was about 20 years. Uh, they finally finished their tests, but now it's being held up by the United States and its British ally, and maybe Australia's involved, uh, which uh, want to use, and in fact are using, the Pacific dependencies for a transit of uh, a nuclear arms and uh, uh, naval uh, vessels, and in fact, uh, uh, sustaining uh, nuclear weapons bases there. Well, what about the Middle East, the most dangerous one? There's an impediment there, too. Uh, support for a Middle East a nuclear-free zone is so broad that uh, the United States has been compelled to formally agree to it at the... There's a, uh, every five years, there's a non-proliferation treaty review uh, meeting. Last one was New York, uh, and uh, overwhelming support for moving in this direction. And the uh, Obama administration, uh, Hillary Clinton was the spokesperson, uh, agreed that yes, it's a very good idea, but with a qualification, several qualifications. It's a good idea, but not now. Uh, and furthermore, there's a condition, uh, any nuclear weapons-free zone uh, will have to exclude Israel and, in fact, exclude any uh, requirement that other states provide information about anything they're doing to support Israeli nuclear weapons. Well, okay, that kills that idea. So yes, now we have this tremendous danger, uh, danger of a deterrent to our uh, actions, and uh, it may move on to a devastating war with all kind of horrible consequences. Well, there are other ways, more far-reaching ways, to deal with the problem uh, generally. Um, a friend of mine, I've actually forgotten who, an Australian friend, maybe here, a couple of, a while back, sent me a, a book of a collection of Australian uh, writings, writers' uh, uh, short essays on uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, it was in 1986, the International Year of Peace, and uh, there was a comment, but there was a, an Aboriginal poet had an, uh, a comment, which uh, is so eloquent that I don't want to paraphrase it, so if I can find it, I'll actually read it. Probably won't be able to. It, uh, the comment was this. Uh, there, there will come a time when our mother, whom the invaders so ruthlessly raped by cutting down her trees, by slaughtering her creatures, and mining her minerals, will retaliate. 
are we so impudent as to expect that we can survive her backlash? Uh, I speak long before the white man came to this land. Uh, he, uh, the dangers of which I speak long before the white man came to this land. In the Northern Territory, there's a green ant dreaming. It is a legend about what will happen if the yellow metal, uranium, is taken from the ground. A giant ant will grow and will devour the living earth. And that's, uh, that's what's happening. Uh, that's the point of the comment, and that's in fact what's happening. And one way to stop the uh, uh, proliferation of nuclear weapons is simply to pre uh, prevent uh, the materials uh, from uh, reaching the developers. And the fact that it'll develop the, the devour the living earth is uh, all too dangerous, all too threatening. That's what Russell and Einstein were warning about. Well, these comments uh, uh, open up uh, 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 the contemplation of a different threat, which actually wasn't evident at the time that Russell and Einstein were issuing their warning, but is very evident today. I learned about it myself about 40 years ago when uh, two personal friends, uh, well-known uh, earth scientists, actually the chairs of uh, the Harvard and MIT Earth Sciences Department, uh, began to talk about the recent discoveries that were emerging about what we now know of as, know of as global warming. Uh, those were the first indications that there's a serious problem coming. And by now, it's a very serious problem and recognized to be the uh, uh, International Energy Association uh, just last couple of months ago uh, issued its latest report, annual report. Uh, they concluded, determined that the uh, last year, the preceding year, the greenhouse gas emissions had reached uh, had a record high, which is pretty striking because it was a year of recession and uh, manufacturing had declined. And they furthermore uh, uh, warned that uh, the extent of global warming was coming very close to reaching what the main scientific consensus regards as a kind of a tipping point, a point beyond which it's irreversible, uh, two degrees centigrade warming. They said that's coming close, and if we reach that point, uh, they don't put it this way, but uh, Mother Earth will be, uh, mother, uh, our mother will be devouring the liver, living Earth. Mother Nature will be devouring the living Earth. We can kiss each other goodbye. Uh, there won't be a possibility of a decent human existence. Uh, well, there are things that can be done about that now, and there isn't uh, a lot of time to waste. And things are being done. Uh, most countries are doing at least something, taking at least halting steps towards addressing the problem. Uh, unfortunately, that's not true of the countries where it matters most. The uh, country where it matters most is, of course, the United States, the richest, most powerful country in history. And it not only is not taking halting steps, it's taking steps backwards. Uh, the Republican Congress now is dismantling uh, 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 programs instituted under Richard Nixon. That's an indication of what's happened in the past roughly 40 years. Uh, they're now dismantling programs under Nixon, who was in fact the last liberal president, if you actually look at the programs. Uh, and that's drawing backwards, the pulling backwards the efforts to t do something or other about global warming. Uh, there are uh, much more positive directions. Uh, they are, in fact, coming mostly from the indigenous communities. Uh, the, in Ecuador, for example, with a substantial indigenous community, uh, there's, uh, there are protests, uh, serious protests. The government's kind of torn by them at the moment. Uh, the indigenous population is calling for an end to uh, 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 mining for uh, oil, uh, which is substantial. Uh, this huge uh, oil exploration with enormous uh, uh, environmental uh, disaster associated with it, apparently much worse than the Gulf of Mexico uh, disaster recently, actually in the Nigerian Delta. There's no doubt that the uh, uh, 
of pollution and destruction is far greater than the Gulf of Mexico. But these are uh, uh, poor people, uh, people of color, so it doesn't really matter what happens to them. Nobody pays attention, unlike the Gulf of Mexico. However, the uh, uh, native communities have, are uh, demanding that uh, all of this stop. They don't see any justification for destroying their lives, their culture, their societies, uh, so that uh, uh, people can sit in uh, traffic jams in New York in their SUVs. Doesn't they argue that's not a fair exchange. Uh, in uh, the most striking case is actually Bolivia, where the indigenous population is a majority and have in the past 10 years uh, entered the political arena, uh, f successfully elected someone from their own ranks as a poor peasant as president, and have been carrying, they in fact taking the international lead now in uh, taking steps towards doing something about global warming. Uh, that's the poorest country in South America. And it's kind, of, it's kind of striking that the poorest country in South America is taking the international lead on this program. And the richest country, not only in the Western Hemisphere, but anywhere in the world, and in fact in history, is uh, uh, not only not contributing, but is drawing back, uh, eliminating efforts to deal with it. Uh, recent, one of the recent efforts in Bolivia was uh, a legislation uh, granting rights to nature. So in addition to human rights, there are now rights to nature. Nature has rights and we have to observe them. Well, you know, uh, sophisticated Westerners can mock this ridiculous idea, uh, but the fact of the matter is that unless we are able to gain some of the sensibility of the indigenous populations, this is worldwide, uh, the last laugh is almost certainly going to be on us. Thank mm -hmm. you.